Hi everyone, I'm Mike Novogratz and this is Next with Novo. Guys, I'm back. Next with Nova with my good friend, Phil Atiba Goff. Do do people give you the three name thing a lot? They never do Phil Atiba. They do Philip Atiba Goff or they do Phil. The one thing, as you know, that they are prohibited from doing is Dr. Phil. (laughs) Don't do it. The PhD is in psychology, but really we will throw hands. Who was I talking to up at Harvard? He was, uh, oh God, he's in the Kennedy School. Used to run the NAACP. Khalil. Uh, Khalil Muhammad. No, no, no. Um, uh, is it Cornell? Cornell. Mm-hmm. Cornell Brooks. Mm-hmm. And when I said I was friendly, Phil, he, he gave the full name. Mm-hmm. Just not Phil Goff. So that's why I think I'd give it to you. Uh, born in Philly. It's true. Give the next DeNovo uh, audience a little bit of backstory. Your life being, you know, born and raised in Philly. Sure. Um, in, in literally West Philadelphia, born but not raised. Um, uh, <clears throat> we're in that time where we're thinking about it. I was born at a very young age, and then we skipped forward a, a ahead. Uh, I did some college courses. I liked them. It got good to me. I went to grad school. I liked that. It got good to me. I got trained as a social psychologist, which is not the kind that helps you with your mother. It is the kind that uh, lies to you and then sees what you do and processes data. On my way out the door from grad school, we had started messing with police departments. I wanted to be talking about racism and the criminal justice system. People weren't talking about police um, in the same way in 1999 to 2005. Then I got a bunch of police chiefs really excited about the idea that they could go back to community and say, hey, turns out there's something to get better. And a bunch of community folks saying, are you telling me the police will give you access to their data? So I founded a nonprofit called the Center for Policing Equity, which is the largest research and action organization on racism and public safety in the world. We gathered a bunch of data. Uh, We survived through Ferguson. We survived through George Floyd. And now we go from reform and harm reduction to abolition and redesign. So before we get to CPE and you know all the work you're doing, let's go back a little bit. Growing up, good looking young black man. <laughs> Where? Where was it? <laughs> you know, your experience with the police, any defining moments? Yeah, there were a couple really scary moments. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I was driving my soon-to-be girlfriend home. Um, uh, you know, I just got off the learner's permit and I was smelling myself a little bit. We stopped to get gas. Um, I went in to get her a little chocolate rose because I was a baller back in the day. Um, uh, and I brought her back and there was a cop talking to her. Um, cop sees me. Cop sees her looking at me. He puts his hand on his gun. He says, ma'am, are you all right? Yeah. He says, no, it's okay. He can't do anything. Are you okay? As if she'd just been sitting there talking to him. Um, uh, but, but it somehow had been kidnapped in the car. What in the world? Um, and you were 16. I was 16. Um, the most dangerous thing around me was the, I had the Afro with like the half second delay. Um, uh, and, uh, and that was just about it. Uh, I was a scrawny kid. And so that stuck with me, obviously. Then in college, I was uh, interviewing for a fancy uh, fellowship. Car broke down. No, not broke down. I caught a flat. My dad had taken the spare already so I couldn't change the tire I had to wait for my dad to show up and this is back before cell phones so I had to go into the nearest place that had a pay phone I put quarters in um, called my dad to come pick me up it was the um, what's called the uh, post office in downtown Philly it was late so I sat on the floor um, <clears throat> waiting for my dad to come pick me up and I fell asleep and an officer nudged me with a nightstick said you people can't sleep here I'm dressed in a suit and an overcoat like this is as nice as I have ever looked in my life I was like, oh, no, officer, you don't understand. And then he just, whack, I, shut the fuck up. I told you, you can't, y'all, y'all people can't sleep here. Um, to this day, I can tell when the weather changes. Wow. Those were my early experiences. I expected that, that police were going to police, which meant bigots were going to bigot, and that there was nothing to be done to make that any better. That's, that's what I grew up believing. So when you, you went to Harvard? True. How did a guy like you enjoy it? Was it, because it's, it's so interesting to go from a place like Harvard where... I'm sure there's racism everywhere, but it's at least understated. Uh, and then you're plunging into this work where it really is helping people see their unconscious bias of actual, you know, how, how, how you're treating people. And so what, what was the Harvard experience like? So it's two things. First, the racism there is shinier, 
right? It's it's where they perfect racism. They do R and D on racism at Harvard and all of the elite institutions, Yale included, where I am now. Um, they they produce next generation racism. Um, and so if you understand that that's part of what's happening with your classmates and also with your faculty instructors, it, it changes the experience that you're having there. But I actually went to a wonderful small liberal arts college known as the African American Studies Department. So while I was there, Cornell West showed up. I was the first undergraduate advisee he had. Um, William Julius Wilson showed up. Um, uh, Larry Bobo showed up. It was just this influx. The New York Times did a cover story on the dream team, right? So I went there, which was this incredibly small, intimate, everybody was in everybody's business, way too much. Um, uh, but you got incredible, deep mentorship in a way that was not available at almost any other place at Harvard. I had a blast. I had a great time. Um, uh, that wasn't everybody's Harvard, not even some of my friends' Harvard. And also around the corner was the only curriculum of the whole place. Harvard teaches one thing. My godfather, I got to give him credit, told me this. He said, Harvard teaches... I can curse on this. Yeah, curse, okay. curse I, I'm, I'm looking at you being like, I can curse, right? Um, it teaches you how to run the fucking world. That's it. And if you're not interested in that, don't sign up for the course. So I'm watching as other people are learning that um, and recognizing that their, the ugliness they were bringing into that curriculum was going to be the ugliness they were going to have as they were running things. At the same time, I was learning, watching people try and learn it so that they could undo it in the world. Let's go to Cornell West for a second because he's just a badass. I sat next to him at a couple, he loves jazz and I sat next to him at a few jazz parties we threw. And just because I was sitting next to him, he was my buddy. He's like, man, they're going to blow a hole in the roof. I use that, ex <laughs> I use that expression all the time now. I don't footnote it. I probably should footnote it. <laughs> you know? Cite my man. He's an academic. You should cite him. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like? He Did was, he call you brother? <laughs> yeah, brother Phil, brother Phil. We are going to be engaged in some existential deep sea diving. Um, so I'd known, um, brother Cornell, um, since I was seven years old, my godfather, the one who told me about the one curriculum at Harvard is a black philosopher. He's kind of known as the Dean of black philosophy. And so Cornell would occasionally come through for Thanksgiving or, or July 4th. Um, so he knew, he knew me a little bit, but I was an annoying kid both before college and during college. He was the most serious, thoughtful mentor to me that I could have imagined in undergrad. We did two independent studies together. He read all the books that I thought should go on there. And he, and in his casual way, he was like, oh, oh Brother Phil, I, I only got a chance to skim the book. And I'm like, well, he's a busy guy, of course. He's like, so if I'm remembering right, it's chapter four, page 167, the third paragraph down, on, on the left-hand side, right? That's 167, yeah. So in that second sentence, <laughs> what on, wait, that's a skim? What, what is wrong with you that that's skimming? Um, so he was deeply invested in that. But also while I was going through my dr dramatic breakup in college, he, would, he was tender and serious with me. He gave me the best advice I got as an undergrad. He said, you are important to the things that you care about. So treat your life that way. Like, and I, I give that out to my own students. I, I still try and give it to myself. He was phenomenal. I know he is a different mentor to different folks, but I got, for sure, the best version of him as a mentor. Yeah, you know, Danielle Allen, who, who became my buddy, uh, she, she said he saved her Princeton career because she was not having fun, and she, he, she stumbled into him, and she had been conservative. She'd been, a, she'd been on the right. <laughs> he pulled her across. <laughs> he, he has that effect on some people, yes. <laughs> She's kind of still a centrist. I love her. Uh, all right, so... You know, we met, I don't know, five, four years ago, five years ago. Yeah, Probably 2018? Four, yeah. 2018, I think, yeah. yeah four years ago. Uh, you won a Ted Audacious Prize. Center for Public Equity went from small to big. Uh, what's that ride been like? Um, or has know, it just kind of happened alongside of this consciousness of, God, our criminal justice system is broken, our policing system is broken and how are we going to try to mend it or fix it? So when we, when we got the audacious award, um, the first thing I felt was relief at that first part of the process that lasted for not five minutes. And then I felt the weight of the obligation of it. And of course we got that in 2019 and the next year, something kind of big happened in racism and policing. So the following year after that transformative, uh, uh, gift, we got even more to grow bigger. But that came with a de demand to do something different. 
So what we had been doing was working mostly through institutions to get the institutions to put themselves out of business, to go through institutions to get to community. The community got organized, activated, got loud enough that we could go directly to community. And now sometimes we're working indirectly through community to change and reduce the harms in law enforcement in addition to doing the redesign. But it, it's like anything that grows really big. We were 19 people in 2019. We're about 119 people now. Um, it's a bucking bronco, right? Like, I'm, remember, I'm a, just a professor. That was my first gig. And they don't, I didn't go to be a professor of management. So I, there's all these skills you got to learn to be able to manage all this mess of a large organization, especially as the space grows, complexifies, and gets massively meaner. Yeah, no. So New York City spends one and a half times on its police force that the Ukraine army spe spends. That's an amazing statistic, right? Ukraine's a big country, 45 million people. Their army seems pretty big. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're fighting off the third biggest army in the world. And we spend one and a half times on our police force. And Joe Biden just said we need to put more money into the policing. And so it's interesting. In lots of ways, in my mind, having you know worked alongside lots of criminal justice reformers, after George Floyd, for a moment, we had won the argument that Brian Stevenson made, that you made, that, that Robin Steinberg made, that our system is broken, it's unjust, it's mean-spirited, it's racially biased, it's uneconomic, and it needs fixing. Like, I think America said yes. And then, rising crime, defund the police, maybe the three worst words for criminal justice reform, even prison abolition, which scares, and it gets weaponized by the right, and it feels like the movement's had a setback. The good news is we're still at the table. Like 10 years, I don't think there was a seat at the table. But how do you think about if you were coaching the whole movement or thinking about your own organization? Like, what's how do you how do you go forward now productively? Given you see this blowback, the politicians are stepping back. Eric Adams ran on a tough on crime, and, and Eric, when you sit with him, is an amazingly compassionate guy and understands the system, but. Want to get elected, mm -hmm. and so how do we how do we go forward here? Yeah, I don't know that any one person's road is going to be the right road. I'll, I, I want to set expectations for anybody who's listening to this and, and is actually thinking, well, how do we go forward? The number one thing is prepare for the next crisis, because on issues that are so jacked up as we do our criminal legal systems in this country, we we make incremental change in the the periods in between, which is where we are right now. That window of 2020 is closed. It's not closing, it's done. So we make incremental change and we set this, we sow the seeds to reap during the next opportunity to do something. And that's gonna be a crisis. It's always been that way. You get what you get and then you come back for the rest. And I think there's a lot of folks who are, who believe that, that the right way to get change is you scream really loud about the things that you believe until you convince people. And I gotta say, you're going you're gonna to lose your voice and gain nothing else in exchange. So that's the first thing is like strap in. I was saying this, if you recall, in the midst of the, the Floyd uprisings, I was saying strap the fuck in. It's a long ride towards where we're trying to get to. That's the first thing. And the second thing is I would encourage folks to, um, to remember there are multiple lanes that are necessary for us all to get there. So you've been, you've been saying actually pretty loudly recently that defund the police, were, you, you hate that, that language. You have not been no. uh, coy about that at all. Not shy. Not that you usually are. Um, I would like to offer a counterpoint, which is this. I think it's fantastic marketing for a particular market. It's fantastic. The people, by the way, put coming up with the slogan, who were advancing the slogan, were not partisan political operatives. They weren't Democrats. In fact, they fucking hate Democrats for the most part. They self-identify as socialists. What they were trying to do was activate folks who are affected, people, particularly young people, um, who are in these neighborhoods, in these communities, but feel like there's no hope. And defund the police resonated with the set of things that they were feeling. And they got them, you're like, you know what, yes. But not, not fuck the police, which is a kind of intimacy that there was not appealing at the time. It was <laughs> defund them. That's right. The size of the beast is the problem. Then what happens is Republicans, having been shell-shocked by the uprisings, are like, okay, now the thing's settled down. I can use this in electoral politics. Yeah, it's weaponized. And, and to, totally. And then you have Democrats come and say, that's the worst thing ever. Why would you? It wasn't for you. Not everything is for you, partisan Democrats. What I wish had happened was that 
along in parallel with defund, had been partisan Democrat language and messaging for target audiences that would appeal to. But what's happened is you got activists saying defund back in 2020. By the way, activists mostly not saying defund right now. Um, you got Republicans then weaponizing it, and you got Democrats Democrats doing shit all. S scared of both sides. Right, exactly. Be like, well, that seemed okay back then, and now it seems really bad. Now they're mad at everybody with absolutely fucking piss in their hands. That is what I wish was different. Not that the slogan had been different, um, uh, not that it wasn't going to get weaponized, because that's always what happens, but that the folks who have elected office well, I, I think had learned more. I think the people in the middle, both in elected office and quite frankly, leading big criminal justice organizations in closed doors were saying, well, I never said to fund the police, but they weren't coming out with the alternative in the middle and say, you know what? Listen to what they're saying. They want to reform the police, really, and we should reform the police. Like there wasn't a, people were scared of pissing off the, the, the far. Uh, I mean, yeah, so there definitely were people who were scared, but when other people came out with messages, yeah, that, that didn't get a lot of attention, a lot of air, air No. So when, you know, activists in Oakland were saying, we really want to talk about refund, right? Refund communities, which is great language um, uh, and is just a subtle play on it. Could have been right on top of, could have gone hand in hand. Nobody was picking that up. And by the way, part of the impetus for the refund language to the degree that that took off at all was, hey, if you defund law enforcement, that's the last thing you've given any money to in the hood. So let's refund communities. It's about investing in communities. Um, uh, when folks... We're talking instead about we got to right size policing, right? Um, we need to not send mental health is not a crime. All of that language that got trotted out didn't get picked up, in part because there were all trial balloons and there wasn't anybody who was pushing it really hard, but in part because it wasn't sexy. The sexy things are going to activate young folks and activists, and they're going to be able to be weaponized by the political right. And then again, we don't have electeds that know enough about the subject matter to stand up and fucking do something. Yeah, mental health is not a fun issue, right? I mean, no, you know, we're, you, I mean, I wrote an editorial recently after Eric cleaned the subways, you know, or said we're going to take all the homeless off the subways. So it's okay, but don't criminalize mental health. And everyone agrees with you, but no one wants to deal with what you do with all the mental health patients. Right. You, know? you, you do that and then you cut funding to the homeless shelters and <laughs> but where the heck they going to go? <laughs> it creates its own problems. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the optimistic. What are you seeing in the data that makes you optimistic, pessimistic? Oh, very little in the, the data on behaviors. Here's what I'll say makes me optimistic is the qualitative data and the conversations I'm having with younger people. Before 2020, we put out a guidance. In 2019, we put out guidance for all elected uh, folks or people who are ca campaigning saying one of the principles you have to operate under is parsimony. Not just for, for prisons, but also for policing. Make it as small as is feasible. Because nobody, nobody has ever been like, great, I'm getting stopped by the police. That has never fucking happened unless you were very fucking high. Um, and then that quickly went bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so parsimony, just that. Our law enforcement partners lost their damn minds when we put that out publicly. Lost their minds. Because we were on the edge of trying to say it out publicly. Now, shrinking this, the footprint of law enforcement, that's a given. Like, if you're not saying that then you are completely untethered to the, at least the political center and left. That's good. And we've got folks who are saying, yes, I want to imagine, and we've had a crisis of imagination, we got to reimagine. But Chase Bank is reimagining banking. Like reimagine is just a, that's a slogan, it's empty. I want to think about what is the plan? What are the right things? And so I got folks applying to graduate school, thinking about new ways of, of being. They're reading differently than they were reading before. So we got folks activated and differently than they were. And I don't think we're retreating on this idea that we punish people before we've ever tried to care for them, and that's fucked up. So I, what, what I've told my team here and all the different criminal justice organizations I'm part of, I said, when I look back on it, there was a brilliant job of convincing people about the unjustness, right? No one did it better than Brian Stevenson, Robin. I mean, there were, there were just so many great, and it outraged people, but we failed miserably as, an organiz as, a, as, a, as a movement to say, what's next? Mm -hmm. Here are the solutions. And so, I mean, we're trying to work on something here where we're kind of imagining the city of the future of what does a criminal justice system look like. Uh, what's a policing, a police force look like in the Indianapolis of the future? Um, funny you should mention Indianapolis. It's a place where they're doing a lot of work to try and reimagine um, policing. So I'm going to borrow from activists because I think it's the right thing. It's the right and honest thing, which is to say, I don't know, but here are some things I do know about what will come with it. So first, 
I don't know how small or large law enforcement would be in an ideal future, in the utopia that I hope that, we, that we'll live in. Um, I do know that we're going to have systems of care before we have systems of punishment. So mental health, when you get it treated, turns out isn't all that scary. It's not nearly as scary. It's hard. Um, it's hard to think about where do folks go when they don't have other family or community. But if you pay for it, you drastically reduce contact with law enforcement. In the states that expanded Medicaid, where CPE has data, expanded Medicaid with the ACA, we see a 15% reduction of the time that police are spending with um, folks with mental illness in the, when they expand that health care, as opposed to the states that didn't expand it. That's huge, 15%. Yeah. Okay, So we're going to have care for mental health, substance abuse, child welfare, homelessness, all the things that we know are co-occurring where police are, are, are. We're gonna have metrics on where is violence and where is not violent, right? A noise complaint. Have you ever had noisy neighbors? No, you've always been the noisy neighbor, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I have been the, the victim of people that didn't like noise. Right, so <laughs> the victim of people who didn't like noise. <laughs> That's a sentence construction only made in America. So when that happens, you don't have a lot of places to call. You don't have the the busybody 911. You don't have the social worker 911. You have armed responders to noise. Sometimes there are people who feel like they want to do that. I have never wanted to do that. Right? Call somebody because like you are having a better time than I want you to be having while I'm sleeping. Like for me, fuck that. But other folks do. If we had other resources, you wouldn't send law enforcement. You know who would not be mad about that? Law enforcement. There is no officer who's ever been happy to go break up a party, unless it was at their exes, right? So those sets of things will be in place and we'll have metrics for what we might want to use law enforcement for versus not. It's, it's not a radical notion that you should have more than an ambulance, a fire truck, or a squad car going, right? But remember, those are all responses to crisis. You and I are fortunate enough that if we've got crises, we got a whole bunch of numbers to call before we'd ever call the state, right? We got friends, we got families, there's couches we can surf on, there's mental health resources we could go get if we needed them, right? Substance abuse uh, resources we could get if we needed them. It's great to have alternative crisis responders. It's better to have investment in, in systems of care. That's the thing I keep trying to stress because when you put them in there, you don't need crisis response. Right? It's hard to figure out how much or where, but I'm, I'm telling you it's going to be also cost effective. I, like, I, just, I you just know it's you, just you, way less expensive. You sometimes wish we could snap our fingers and break the country into cities of 25,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Lots of them because you know, I think of our criminal justice system, 10 million, 10 and a half million people that go through 49 days on average stay. It's just this machine. But one good piece of news, I just got sent someone yesterday the total jail pop prison population for the first time in 22 years is under 2 million, 1.9. When we, when I started five years ago, it was 2.3. Yeah. And so the work, the work is working slowly. Yep. Yep. I mean, the trajectory is good in lots of ways on the incarceration side, on the policing side. I, I wish there were more encouraging numbers. Um, police killings are around the same level in most of the cities where we're not working, but where we're collecting data. Police use of force is constant. We're on the way back up. Um, racial disparities are as wide as they've been since we started tracking this stuff. And police budgets are, have increased since the calls to defund police. If we were going to find like a, so I'm a macro guy, I love charts. If we were going to have a racism index in America, mm -hmm. how has the, the line gone in the last 20 years? Oh man. Um, you ever see a Kandinsky painting? Like, like it's it's up and down and backwards. It's uh, Jeremy Barami, right? It, it's it's all over the place. Because um, racism obviously isn't one thing. It's a whole bunch of different things. So if I were trying to create an index fund for racism, um, I wouldn't even know where to start because we were doing well on, on explicit bigotry. We were doing very well. It was in decline up until Obama. And then we started seeing, to the degree that we were, we were literally tracking this stuff, we started seeing spikes. And then you thought it couldn't get worse than eight years of the Tea Party heckling a black president. Um, and then somehow it did. For four years, it was off, the, off of the charts we had built before. And yet, awareness that racism isn't just prejudice starts to go up. Sort of, sort of uh, a sense of structural components to racism, that gets better. Um, uh, 
uh, the resources for job placement and uh, data for tracking these things, those all get better, which indicates that there's a municipal sort of awareness of this stuff as well. But the actual data on those things gets worse significantly under Trump. Um, uh, and it wasn't massively better under Obama either. So I, I don't know. Like lived experience has been getting shitty for the last uh, 12 to 14 years. Um, uh, awareness and the infrastructure necessary to make change, I think maybe gets better. Interesting. I have this graph that drives me in some ways, which is black wealth as a percentage of U.S. wealth, mm -hmm. right? We're 13% black America and we're less than 2% black wealth. And I'm like, until that curve turns up, we've got a broken country. We don't have to get back to 13%. We're not going to get there for a long time. But we got to get the first derivative positive. We actually really need to get the second derivative positive. Then everyone will feel good. Mm -hmm. But the first derivative is still negative. There's, I, was talk, I was talking to Martin Luther King III last night. That's a little name dropping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. I, I, you know, and uh, I was thinking to myself, since his father died, you know, since the Civil Rights Act, black wealth as a percentage of total wealth is actually lower, not higher. That's right. That's insanity. Also, school segregation is worse than it was under Brown. Uh, we're going backwards on inequality, and we have been for some time. Um, uh, it got way worse the last four years, um, uh, or I should say the last six years in, uh, under Trump, and uh, the pandemic has made all of that even worse. The thing that drives me nuts We've had two full years to figure out that messaging on inequality can go towards everybody because the pandemic, inequality is a driver of the thing. And we haven't figured out the right way to sell that. We, we don't, I don't think that folks on the political left, such as it is in this country, genuinely believe that inequality hurts everybody. And as a result, they don't message like they believe it. What's well, also interesting, like our culture is so much black culture. Like blacks dominate culture in lots of ways. Uh, from hip hop to style to... And so you would think that would, with young people at least, kind of seep in and, and, and be a solve against some racism, but... It can be, and it, off, it actually often does work that way. The issue is that people don't stay young, much to my chagrin, <laughs> right? They start having jobs and they don't live near any black people and they're like, well, you know what? That music is really loud. Not like the black music when I was, when, when I was young, black people were so much more respectful. They didn't sag their <laughs> pants. No one was shouting defund. Why are they on my lawn? Um, so <laughs> I have talked to my wife about this. I have friends that went to the same type high school, the same college, worked at the same company. And so this kind of the same socioeconomic group. And now I'm 57, they're 57. I'm like, how did they get so conservative? I, somebody at one point is going to give me a, the lesson on how some people get so angry and conservative. Um, and I actually put those words together because it feels like that. Anyway, I shouldn't digress, but it, it does. There is something about age. I mean, is, I, I wish it were otherwise, but in every country. But by the way, as we're talking about black culture everywhere, in every place that has access to culture from vulnerable groups, youth culture is vulnerable group culture. Is that right? That's, ev That's pretty interesting. much everywhere, right? It, it used to not be as much the case when culture was a little bit more circumscribed and you didn't have democratic access to it. But now that the internet is in the palm of my hand and up in my face all day, every day, everywhere that has access to vulnerable culture, youth culture is vulnerable culture. It's not just black. It's just in the United States, it's been mostly black. You're going to start to see more native culture influencing youth culture at the same time because now we got access to it. Turns out native culture is the shit, has been for a long time. And... Folks who are managing to navigate culture in the context of, of oppression, that appeals to this process of trying to figure out who the fuck I am at all times, regardless of race. Part of the problem in the United States, we tell this lie about ourselves that we made ourselves up, right? Like I'm, I'm self-made, like whatever the fuck that is, right? Um, and that means, Don't get me started on self-made. Right. So that means this music, well, that was just my music. Why are you putting race on it, right? Like why does it have to have a color? Motherfucker, because the person doing it had a color, and his color had a whole heck of a lot to the, to the culture that he or she produced. And yet, we whitewash that, and in fact, it makes me feel bad, so I remove from it, especially when I get to be middle age. And I got young people now engaged in black culture that is scary to me. It's, that's a cycle that is about as American as anything else. How's Yale? You know, it's funny, because you're, you're out there fighting the, the good fight, and then you're in this ivory tower mm -hmm. <laughs> with my son uh, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of other 
Very diligent students. <laughs> Other diligent students. It's good to know that he's doing well and being diligent. I, I, Yale is, to me, very much like Harvard in my experience. Um, my Yale kicks ass. I have a number of deeply engaged black colleagues doing you know, amazing work. Um, I, am, I now live in a community where there are n- numerous black faculty having their black kids, sharing time and babysitting duties and uh, recipes for the cookout. Um, I'm having a blast. African American studies is a blast. My colleagues are phenomenal. That is not the only Yale. And oftentimes I get to engage with students who have a different Yale experience. Um, The Yale um, that is still wrestling with the legacy of slavery and how that created massive wealth for the university. That's still wrestling with the departments that are not as dope as African American studies and and genuinely don't care about those students' experiences. it's massive concentrated wealth and privilege, and both in good faith and in bad faith, sort of as, a, as performative, they make space for other folks. And those other folks are often the most amazing human beings you would ever want to meet, and they struggle in that universe. So it is my privilege to learn from them and occasionally give them something maybe useful back to them. But I'm having myself a blast. Oh, good to hear. So now, what's next? So I think... In the public safety space, there's a couple of things that are next. And then I think you're also asking about what's next for me, and I'll, give, I'll do that yeah. too. Public safety, if we were going to try and say, what do you think safety is? But I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the communities that are over-policed or that are deeply policed, um, uh, the communities that are crying out, that are vulnerable. What do you think safety is? It turns out they don't think that reported crime captures that very well. So what are the right data? There's a lot of organizations sort of sniffing around that area, we are trying to develop a science of the social determinants of public safety, the things that make communities say that they're safe. Yeah. We do that in health all the time. Social determinants of public health is a thing. We don't do that on safety. Once we've got those... Would you let your kid walk alone? Would you... Mm -hmm. You know, do your kid... Does your kid walk to school? Like this... And it turns out when you ask communities, they they say things that are totally unrelated. Like... Hey, um, how sure am I that I'm going to sleep here again or that I'm going to get kicked out of this housing, right? Um, <clears throat> how comfortable am I going to the local, you know, the bodega or the grocery store and that rats didn't crap in the food? Things like that, by the way, had nothing, never had anything to do with police, except they have a lot to do with how communities feel safe. If we started collecting data on that, how different would we think about what the role of law enforcement should be. Yeah, I've got a guy here that always is like, let's take just a little bit of the police money and pick up the trash. He's a big trash guy. Like, clean up, this, clean up the neighborhood and people feel better. They do. Um, but we haven't even listened about what, what makes communities say they feel safe. That's a big portion of what we're doing next. Um, what we did in Ithaca and Tompkins County, where we were able to facilitate a process where community led it, and they said, what do we want to do for public safety? After the process were done, it's like, how on earth do we have policing as the number one way to respond? So they are dismantling their police department, and they're putting together a department of public safety. Everybody going to keep their jobs. right? That's a labor issue. It's also an actual safety issue. But now they're going to be accountable to a non-sworn, a civilian leader, nonviolent calls for service. We're going to have no guns go in response to that. And they're going to have to justify their budget every year just like everybody else does. That's exactly what Measure 2 in Minneapolis was trying to get at, but it's even more radical. When you lead with communities, it turns out we got the union to even uh, ride in support of it. So those kinds of, of opportunities to genuinely redesign how we're delivering public safety. That's what's next for CPE. It's where we're investing the majority of our, our time, energy, and our funding. For me, I am exhausted. Senator Phil. Oh, please, no. I said I started with I'm exhausted, and now you want me running for office. For sure, no. <laughs> Um, uh, also again, that requires being on TV. This is a face made for radio and a body made for the couch. It is not in me to do this. Um, uh, I am exhausted by a problem that I used to think was an academic problem or an intellectual problem. And I, I was wrong on what it was, which is within 15 seconds of a young black man getting shot and killed by the cops. Um, uh, we're talking about whether or not he deserved it within 15 days of a young black woman getting killed by the cops. However, however it happened, we're talking about whether or not she deserved it. Maybe if they pulled their pants up, well, they had drugs in the house. They, they have pictures on Instagram showing that they, they enjoy weed, even though it's legal. They're posing with a gun, even though it's a right to carry state. That's not an academic problem. It's not even a policy problem. It's a narrative problem. We're telling a story. 
So I, I tell everybody I work with on this new project, um, if I showed you a, a, a video and it's a young, relatively attractive woman, um, her hair is up in a messy bun and she's got glasses on, she's walking a dog and she falls down. She's got dirt all over and then a handsome gentleman with a British accent picks her up and they have a kind of awkward experience. You know exactly what the fuck movie we're looking at. This is a rom-com, that was a meet cute. They're gonna have trouble and then get together at the end, right? And if you're, depending on the rom-com, you might watch them have sex in a kind of occluded way. We have genres that tell us information. They fill in the stories around the edges for lots of different things. We have a genre for black death by the state. We don't have a genre for black dignity or black life. So I got an opportunity to try tell tell stories that untell the lies that we tell about ourselves. And it feels like that is absolutely core to my academic work and to my activism. So that's that's a, now a, a company called Justice Rx. We're a pod on the Warner Brothers television lot. Um, and we consult with Warner Brothers television to help sort of diagnose and remove the, the obstacles to full humanity for black and brown folks from the vulnerable communities. So we do consulting for them and in the industry. And we also develop our own slate of storytelling. Nice. I'm a, you know, if I kind of rolled it back myself five years ago and was like, what philanthropy would I do? It would almost be all narrative. A, it's what I'm good at. Uh, B, it's like, and you, you need the data to, to, to have credibility to shift narrative and understand. But like, I think that's where even the criminal justice, we haven't done a good enough job on that second that's narrative. Right. And right. Uh, anyway, that's awesome. One day I'll uh, try to get on one of your shows as an extra. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was on Billions this year. I was in the Kanye doc. I mean, I've, I've got two... I got two credits. You know? <laughs> All right, man. All right. Well, give me your headshots. We'll take a look. <laughs> well, Phil, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's, you know, there's not a lot of guys that decide they're going to spend their life in policing. Uh, you know, short, black, good looking guys from Philadelphia. <laughs> and trying to, it's really when we found, when we, we met, I was like, he's the only guy in the lane, really, of trying to understand and, and coming at it really from a, a smart uh, and empathetic way of, of not saying you guys suck, but like, hey, let me help you try to understand the impact you're having on, on the, how your decisions, right? Mm -hmm. I'll never forget you said, I don't care what you think about me, I care how you treat me. And that, that's powerful to think about. And so good on you for taking that lane and doing the work and uh, good luck as a movie man. Uh, you know. <laughs> we're starting the small screen first don't put me in, don't put me with Ryan Reynolds just yet you could like call us something like I can see a little Spike Lee you can produce direct and star see I feel like I'm being stereotyped for being short now I feel like that's <laughs> definitely what's happening stay off the d dating apps my son says if you're short on the dating apps <laughs> yeah, like it just doesn't work I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stay stick with the wife I got yeah <laughs> <laughs> alright guys that's another episode with Next with Novo Phil thanks a ton and we'll see you soon <laughs>